The following video features excerpts taken from four recorded live lessons on drawing a landscape with oil pastels. To learn more about how you can access this complete series, as well as the other recorded live lessons, courses, and lesson plans, visit thevirtualinstructor.com forward slash members. So again, I'm not putting super heavy pressure here, just medium pressure, and I'm kind of Still going with diagonals. I'll, I'll make little small circles and kind of go at diagonals at different points. And it depends on how far you want to take this. You know, the tooth of the paper showing through and that texture is kind of interesting. And I'm putting some real heavy pressure on the pastel uh, to make these cloud-like marks here. Now, one thing you got to keep in mind, too, um, there... The reason why we see and understand things in a painting or a drawing is because of how everything in the painting or drawing works together to create the illusion. So, uh, you know, right now, all we've got are some marks up at the top of the paper. There are some blues and a little bit of yellow. Um, and it's only going to look like clouds when we have it in the context of there's a ground plane underneath here and, and define that now. I know the purple is not the same color as what we're seeing in the reference, but uh, this is an opportunity to exaggerate and create a little bit of additional contrast here. Sure. Application here. So you see those purple undertones kind of help give it a little bit of, you know, before we are even adding any white on here. It gives us a little bit of contrast, a little bit of a color contrast between the sky and the mountains. If we were just stuck with blue, we wouldn't have that. And we can also build up applications, just like we can build up applications with colored pencils, where we get to a point where the binder is really uh, present on the surface and we get some burnishing happening. Same thing kind of happens with oil pastels. You know, you've got this stage here where the tooth of the paper is really strong. And then when you, when you layer enough that you cover up the tooth of the paper, the surface becomes really buttery. And don't forget that you're creating an illusion when you're doing this. Yeah, I say that over and over again, don't I? <laughs> but it's really true. Uh, I think a lot of times people kind of get hung up in the subject that they're drawing or painting and uh, they feel like they have to make a replica of it. And instead, you just want to look at the lines and shapes and we don't want to, we want to make sure that we have that curve happening and you can make it even more angular where that rock happens. Um, it's up to you how you want to do it, but you, you probably don't want to make sure it's, you want to make sure it's not straight across. You want to make sure that that line curves and that your composition stays pretty dynamic. Bunch of scribbles. <laughs> it's interesting how a bunch of scribbles come together and uh, make an image. But you have to be patient, and you have to allow those scribbles to come together. Uh, too many people start making their scribbles, and uh, then they say, well, wait a minute, this doesn't look like what I'm trying to draw. So they stop, and they think they're no good, and they expect immediate results, and that's not how it works. And you, I need to be careful right here, too. I don't want to start making these huge vertical strokes right here that just kind of don't make sense with what's really happening with how tall the grass is growing up back there. You know, you might even just make a vertical mark, I mean a horizontal mark, and uh, don't worry about putting these little indications of the direction that the grass is growing. It's completely up to you, of course. And do the same thing over on the other side. Yeah, and then we'll just kind of keep making those shapes there allowing the sky to show through and you can imagine if we would have started with these trees and then tried to fill in the sky and the mountains in the distance around that it's that's impossible the the truth of the matter is a lot of people think that you're going to get to a point where you have all the answers and those feelings of doubt will stop coming up and let me tell you they don't <laughs> ever go away. In fact, the more experienced you become, the more 
the more you kind of think about what you're doing, which is good. But if you allow it to kind of hinder what you're doing, then it can get away of your creativity and uh, kind of hold you up. And we just want to put hints of color here and there. Um, you know, it'd be real easy to just kind of start going over everything with each color, but really we want to have the variety in the color. So, And one thing that I would suggest is that you don't get overworked over the colors and making them exactly the same. Um, a lot of people kind of obsess over that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, sometimes if you're not careful, it can paralyze you. You kind of get stuck in one area of a painting or a drawing and just keep reworking it and working it. And uh, you're going to drive yourself crazy doing that. Uh, a, a river of yellow <laughs> that kind of pulls you up over here and then back across. And the more that we add down here and the more interest we add, especially down here in this corner, uh, the less that rock in the center is going to become, or is going to be a dominating factor. Uh, stop thinking like a pencil. You know, we're, we're trained to think like where everything we make a mark with is like a pencil because that's what we're given when we're children. And that's how we learn how to roll to write. <laughs> you know, we learn how to write and we usually learn how to draw with a pencil initially. So it only makes sense that every medium that we pick up, we think of it as like a pencil and it's hard to break away from that. And since we're kind of taking a looser approach, we're going to let our viewers mind do some of the work for us. And we're just going to concentrate on making marks that kind of mimic the grass. Don't worry about those white flowers or yellow flowers yet. That's going to be one of the last things we add. So you can, you can see here that the colorless blender is really muddying things up. Muddying is not the right term, but kind of mixing things together and making it a little bit blurrier. And But at the same time, it's also working the material into the tooth of the paper. So when I layer colors over the top of this, we won't have to worry about the tooth of the paper and they'll, they'll feel a little bit more like they make sense with the rest of the, the rest of the image. With the rest but again, I think a lot of people, they don't, they never make it to the point <laughs> where uh, that all the fun, interesting things happen. They put so much pressure on themselves early in the drawing, or even in the later stages of the drawing at different points. And uh, if things aren't going exactly the way that they thought they should go, um, they stop and they give up. Right, we'll pull a few of those strokes up here on the side. And we'll just let them get a little bit smaller as they go off in the distance. And maybe we'll put in a little indication of maybe a, another patch. Pastels are so thick on here. We can just take the, the palette knife and we can put a, some additional indications of some strokes in here. We can even pull up uh, some indications of branches and things. Now, of course, and they're really not white in the reference, but what's happening is uh, the color underneath, the yellow that we've already put down, the yellow ochre, is going to mix with these and tone them down and make them look a little bit more natural. And I want to make sure that I don't just blanket the bottom here with dark value. I can make this side a little bit darker, though, because that would create a little bit too much uh, heaviness down here at the bottom. Angle. Uh, so I've got a 90 degree angle right there. And I'm just going to pull it straight out to the side. Mm -hmm. 